yes, I am an astronomer. And I took my telescope with me because in some sort, it's the essence of what we are talking of. But now, hand over to Stephanie. Stephanie, may you introduce yourself as well, please? Thanks, Norbert. My name is Stephanie Wan. I'm the former chair of the Space Generation Advisory Council. In addition, I am also a contractor at NASA headquarters working at the Space Communications and Navigation Office and on a part-time detail at the State Department. Thank you. M may, may it look like a bit like an Oscar nomination at the moment, but in fact, here come our nominees. And the first one we're looking on is Mr. Gerd Kraft, sorry, Dr. Gerd Kraft from the DLR. He's a physicist, studied at the University of Marburg and Manchester, and later on worked at the Max Planck Institute for fluid dynamics. He worked at ERNO, so whenever you want to see like the Germans changing acronyms, you have to talk with Gerd because he lived it all through. ERNO, DARA, DLR, everything, all the nice acronyms that there were. He was at a certain point the head of DLR department commercialization, but now he's the head of the department ESA affairs of DLR space administration. And since 2016, he's the head of the program directorate of DLR space administration. Gerd, may I invite you to the stage? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm not an optics specialist. I work for a space agency, but I've been uh, with this technology for quite a long time, and I'm very happy to see that ripen, becoming mature over the time. Um, actually, uh, let me start with a bit of a detour. I was in Canada some time ago, and I passed a city which is called Bedeck in Nova Scotia. This is where Ex Ex Alexander Graham Bell lived, the inventor of the telephone, and there I saw this invention. So his idea was to uh, focus uh, sunlight onto a device which looks a bit like a microphone, and this uh, thing modulates the light. The light is then transmitted to something which we'd call a telescope. And then you demodulate that light into acoustic wave, and then you have something which he called a photophone. And the quote, his quote is, he, uh, he was very proud of this invention. He said, this is the greatest invention I've ever made. This is greater than the telephone. Can the imagination picture what the future of this invention is to be? You may talk by light to any visible distance without any conduction wire. In general science, discoveries will be made by the photophone that are undreamed of just now. So after a few disruptive technologies as uh, laser technologies and space technologies and electronics and so on, here we are. This is a global laser network in space and this is operating. Uh, this is uh, the picture of the EDRS, the data relay system which, we've been worked, uh, with, which uh, we have been setting up together with industry and the PPP, ESA and uh, this, the participating space agency and this is actually working. Well, this has also some time to go. There were some laser communication experiments in space. These were just trials. I, uh, some guys might remember that ESA had a technology satellite uh, roughly 20 years ago, Artemis, and there was a terminal on board, Silex, and we had tests there, links to Spot 4 and also to a Japanese satellite, Oysat. And uh, 2008, there was a, a test a combination of a German satellite and an American satellite, Terrasun and Enfire. This was uh, Leo Leo direction, and uh, we had a data transmission rate of 5.6 gigabits by directional. The distance of the satellites were 8,000 kilometers, had a relative velocity of 25,000 kilometers per hour, which is uh, quite amazing for uh, the, the, the two satellites, and uh, it was quite a feat to have their very short acquisition time. Uh, this gave uh, our industry and, and our developers really experience how to do the real thing. And uh, there are still some, some steps in between. We had an AlphaSat demonstration, also the, te the terminals, the laser terminals, which were later on the board of EDRS, uh, which we had also some trials to the Sentinel satellites, Sentinel-A and 1A and 2A, and also to an optical ground station on the Canary Islands. Uh, in parallel, our colleagues from the DLR Institute develops a smaller to an optical terminal called Osiris, Osiris, which uh, proved uh, their capabilities to do Leo ground uh, connections. Uh, 
So where are we now? So the uh, data relay system is operational now. We have a geostationary satellite EDRSA, which was uh, a payload which was launched last year, and it serves uh, the Sentinel satellites which are up there now. Three of them, there will be four of them at the end of the year, the Sentinels, and there are four more in production, and they will all be equipped with laser terminals, and uh, then the EDRS system is an integral part of the whole space segment of Copernicus. And this is a real benefit for Earth observation uh, constellation, Earth observation satellites, because we can harvest much more data. And it has also the nice feature that we could uh, hear something what we call quasi real time data transmission. So you wouldn't, wouldn't have to wait for a ground station to dump your data. You, you can do it any time with this system. And so the, uh, the transmission time from taking a, an image to giving it to the user is roughly 15 minutes. And most of that time is used for processing the picture. So this system works quite well, and uh, we are looking forward to having an evolution of that. So this system has been set up with the public-private partnership. Airbus is operating that system. They're planning to evolve that with a third node, which would be on the other side of the Earth, would be uh, over the Pacific, and could also there connect to Earth observation satellites and also to Earth observation constellations from, uh, from, from uh, other uh, partnering uh, systems. And uh, then we could have also quasi real-time service around the globe, transmitting the data very fastly just around the Earth. And, but we are not going to stop the developments here. We're still supporting industry, TSAT, and we will hear more about their portfolio in uh, developing um, laser terminals for different applications. I think what, what is a very promising application are what we call the so-called mecha constellations. Uh, I, I, I'm really questioning how one could have a business case if 70% of the investment what you have on uh, your mega constellation is just over ocean and not connected to any ground station. If you have intersatellite links, you could use the whole system uh, at the fullest. And I think there is a, good, a promising application for laser communication. Also, space to air links, Leo to ground links, uh, geo to ground links, using uh, optical communication for high throughput satellites uh, in feeder links. We're also working on the vision to have all optical satellites com combining laser communication with onboard photonics, so to have a complete optical system there on board on satellites. And, and what we also think will be a very attractive application is working with entangled photons, which is not only of interest for a fundamental science, it's just to convince, one, convince uh, oneself how nice the quantum mechanics is, but this is a real application, might be also a commercial application in the realm of cybersecurity. So that's uh, for an introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gerd. Next we have Dr. Phil Stimson. He has worked, in, he, Dr. Phil Stimson is the Australian Defense Science Technology Group, and he has worked in his career as a scientist in different university institutes and governmental institutes, both in the US at Caltech JPL, as well as Australia. He has specialized in leading R&D in new communication systems, such as protected satellite communications, machine learning architectures for optimization of communications, as well as mobile ad hoc radio networking. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm from the Australian Department of Defence, and I want to give you a couple of slides on where we are at the moment in defence satellite communications, then how potentially this can be approved with optical communications. And finally, a couple of slides on optical communications R&D we're doing at our Defence Science R&D Lab here in Adelaide. So where we are today is that we have lots and lots of geostationary satellites strung around the Earth in just about every frequency band you can imagine, from the UHF frequency band up to the KA frequency band. All of those, or most of those satellites have steerable spot beams on them that we can steer anywhere we like on the globe. And they are uh, perhaps produced at a beam diameters of 100 or 200 or 300 kilometers. And uh, sometimes they might even be created by phased array antennas on the spacecraft, which means we can shape them however we want. 
That, that's obviously mated with a ground segment which is, consists of anchor stations linked together by fibre. Now the workhorse frequency bands are actually in the X band which means we transmit it 8 gigahertz from the ground and we receive down from the satellite at 7 gigahertz and KA band which means we transmit at 30 gigahertz and we receive at 20 gigahertz on the ground. And we have about 2 gigabits or something like that per satellite around the globe and there are many, many satellites. Now that all sounds pretty good, it's a good picture. Unfortunately, this is what happens in reality. That instead of being spread all around the globe, some crisis occurs in some particular location. And what we want to do is we want to train all of those beams on that crisis location to maximise the amount of data rate that we can get onto that one point on the Earth. And we can't do it. Because the reason is that we have got that capacity through frequency reuse in all of those beams, just as we would on a terrestrial radio frequency communication system like a mobile phone system. We can actually reuse the frequencies from satellite to satellite because our directional antennas can point at one satellite or the other satellite. What we can't do is we can't reuse the same frequencies on the same satellite in different spot beams. So instead of getting gigabits per second of capacity, we're generally operating down at megabits per second of capacity. And that's a big problem. It's not enough. So an obvious replacement for that using optical communications, which would give us a lot more data rate, is just to replace every single link in that picture with optical comms. We would have optical links from the satellites to ground, we might go to our anchor stations on high mountains to avoid the weather. We would have optical links down to our tactical military platforms, as shown there. And we would have optical inter-satellite links to better distribute the data rate in space. Now, that's a bit of a problem for Australia. It's very expensive to do it that way, and we don't have some of the requirements. So I think in the near term, for military communications, we're going to be doing more of a hybrid architecture like this. In Australia, we have plenty of desert and no high mountains, so we're going to be having a distributed ground segment in the desert where we don't have to worry so much about weather, and obviously if we have a number of different stations, we should be able to ensure high enough availability for those links. For the links from the satellites to the tactical military platforms, we're probably going to stick with RF links for a while to mitigate the availability issues with weather and rain um, and uh, dust and smoke, etc. Don't forget that in the military, weather is only our secondary problem. Our primary problem is uh, electronic warfare in a contested environment from our adversary. So any commercial type availability figures are beyond our, our, our possibilities. We probably will go to optical links to high altitude aircraft and we probably will link it all together with a terrestrial fibre architecture. And that system is probably more affordable than the all optical links for us. Now at my institution at Defence Science Technology, the lab here at Adelaide, we're doing some limited research in optical communications. We've built a 1.5 kilometre uh, test uh, range system and we've got uh, test optical comm systems at 1.5 micron, operating in the hundreds of megabits range. We're mostly interested in high reliability links rather than in the very highest data rate, rate links, and therefore we're concentrating a lot on how we, do we mitigate optical scintillations. We've got a lot of numerical simulation capability on that, and we've also built some hardware simulation systems for simulations, for scintillations. We also have uh, an optical ground station capability that is basically being built for space situational awareness, that is finding out what's up there, but we believe that we can repurpose that to be an optical ground station for links from satellites to ground. And we've also uh, developed here a single photon silicon array that we hope to integrate with that. Finally, we do have a huge amount of interest in quantum key distribution and quantum communications, of course, like everybody else does. We're probably not going to do a lot of that at the Australian Defence uh, Research Labs. We're probably going to partner with uh, academic institutions, with companies, and um, with other government agencies to do that work. And this uh, slide shows some of them uh, in that arrangement. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Phil. By now you understand more or less how this one works. We have very nice presentations and you get a bit of insight. And then of course comes the second, the tough part on the whole thing. You got to ask some clever questions. We don't force you to go to the microphone. What we do is simply we ask these nice volunteers to move around and you can write down your questions and we collect them over there. We hand them over and we will ask the questions then afterwards in the second time. So while you hear a few more talks, think about what you want to ask. Now we had a talk from an Australian colleague. Now you stay in the LGR, the limited jet lag region. So we more or less go a bit up to Japan and we go to Shiro San. This is Dr. Yamakawa. Shiro Yamakawa, he was born in 69 in Tokyo, Japan. He received his degree in electrical engineering and his PhD was afterwards in material science in Tokyo. He joined the National Space Development Agency of Japan and he was engaged in research and development of inter-orbit laser communications in 1997. He's now the mission manager of GDRS project. Seems more or less the equivalent to the EDS we just heard before. He's a member of the Japan Society of Applied Physics, the Institute of Electronics, Information and Communication Engineers of Japan and the Japanese Society for Aeronautical and Space Sciences. Shiro-san, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Norbert, and uh, good evening, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shiro Yamaka. I would like to make a short presentation about uh, Japanese activity, about, uh, about Japanese uh, JAXA's activity about the uh, optical data relay satellites. This slide shows the uh, outline of our, uh, my presentation. And why, the first point is uh, why JAXA satellite program goes to optical communication. The next, the next generation of uh, the, the next generation satellite program needs uh, optical. So I would like to enhance, enhance so the, and I would like to enhance the, those, uh, those aspects. And, uh, and uh, in the, in, and uh, second, as a one, first step of the, this approach, JAXA has launched, uh, JAXA has started Japanese Optical Data Relay System, JDRS. I would like to introduce uh, some of the brief summary of this satellite program. Here, uh, I summarize near, uh, needs for optical data, uh, optical space data relay systems. As you know, the, the Leo, Leo satellite system, especially these satellites are used for Earth observation. The, the sensors on the Earth observation satellites is involved. It's, uh, it's achieved high resolution and wide swaths, and also, in, in addition, also color bands are required. And this, this situation, this situation results increase in observation data volumes. And in addition, JAXA is an entity of the Japanese government and we need, uh, we, need to help the, we need to help the Japanese government's activity. And finally, the, the people of Japan and, and help, the, all, help the people of the, all over the world. In that aspect, this management is a very important issue on JAXA in JAXA. And the, in, the, in the point of disaster management, quick, quick acquisition of observation data and delivery to the user is very important. And in addition, wide communication area is uh, the, the required. This, is, this shows, uh, this, this slide, in this slide, we show uh, some picture of earthquake in uh, attacked the north, north region of Japan, uh, north, north, northeast region of Japan. As, uh, this is, uh, causes more than 3,000, uh, well, 30,000 people of death. It's, it's, uh, the situation shows uh, the high data distribution and uh, the high resolution data, uh, data acquisition and high, uh, Quick, uh, quick, uh, deliver, uh, quick delivery of the satellite data is very important. And uh, in optical space data, uh, in, optical, uh, in optical space data communication, there is another process. 
Actually, uh, we, have, we can lower negative frequency interference. It's, it's very important to the, the recent situation and recent, recent situation. And uh, in addition, future technical breakthroughs such as quantum cryptography is very attractive. And uh, JAXA goes optical data relay system, satellite systems. This shows the advantage of JDRS. JDRS has two advantages. One is, a, the, that, uh, one is a, that one is that of data relay system, and two, the another is a, as a merit of optical communication systems. This 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 slide in the downside of down left side of the, this present uh, this seat, we show the. We show the wide coverage of the uh, wide coverage of data relay satellites of the system, and uh, this results a shorter turnaround time to data distribution. JAXA has, able, uh, JAXA has developed uh, interorbit links with Japan, uh, interorbit inter links system, data relay system. First step is uh, using RF's uh, radio, wave, radio wave frequencies. It's the, the DRTS was um, the developed the first step of the data relay system. It uses uh, all, all RF communications. The next step, this is experimental mission. It was uh, introduced in also, it was also introduced uh, Gerd's uh, presentation on. Uh, it's a satellite satellite and uh, JAXA's OSS satellite are communicated by the optical. And the next step, JDRS and uh, ELOS-3. ELOS-3 is uh, JAXA's uh, new generation as observation satellites. We, we, uh, we, we, we would like to, demo, we, we want to, demo, we, need, we, uh, we aim to uh, demonstrate between these satellites, optical links, and data uh, transform data relaying mission. This is an overview of the JDRS program. JDRS program consists of one data, one, one, one geo satellites, and uh, one, uh, the two optical terminals, one is for the JDRS system, and uh, the other is to, uh, is, uh, the other is bought on ELO3 satellite. And the feedering system is used. The feedering system is the RF system. The main contractor is the NEC Corporation of Japan, and we use a wavelength of 1.5 micrometers. We will, we are planned to launch this satellite. 2000, uh, 2090 Japanese fiscal year, and we estimate the mission period 12 years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Yamakawa-san. Next, we have Dr. Steve Towns, who is a Chief Technologist at the Interplanetary Network Directorate at NASA's JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's worked in many different offices related to deep space communications network, including the Mars LaserCom demonstration. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, try to do this uh, relatively quickly because I'm sure everybody's out there writing a lot of questions that we're going to get to answer. So, um, first of all, just a little um, history. We've had uh, within NASA. NASA actually started in the optical comm research world at least as early as the middle 1970s. Uh, that's both good and bad because depressing. It's been that long, and here's here's where we are today. In some sense, wish we were a lot farther along. Uh, I will note that we had a lot of early demonstrations starting in the 90s. Galileo, uh, basically just shooting a laser in, into space, um, six million kilometers to to Galileo. Had a lot of cooperative demonstrations with uh, what was NASDA, now JAXA, and NICT. Um, and really appreciate the, the collaboration on those, both for with uh, ETS-6 and, uh, and OISITS, and learned a lot of things, I guess, about, about optical comm in, in working those uh, collaborative experiments. Um, most recently, uh, more recently, in fact, in 2013, we had the uh, uh, lunar laser communication demonstration, which uh, set a record. Um, you can see the, all the publications and things, uh, a, lot, a lot of PR on this, but 622 megabits per second from the moon, 400 uh, 
1,000 uh, kilometers, uh, which is you know, a factor of 10 better than geo, which makes, means from a comm perspective a factor of 100 off. So uh, that's a pretty, pretty impressive experiment, and uh, we, we're hoping to capitalize on that moving forward. Um, another slight look at, again, things that we've done in, uh, in, in NASA, not nearly as impressive perhaps as, as LADI. Uh, it's only 50 megabits per second, but we had an optical comm uh, oper not operational in the, in the sense of uh, mission-oriented uh, operational, but uh, a station, an optical comm terminal on the ISS uh, in 2014. Lasted about two years that we did a lot of experiments, optical comm experiments, but the key thing was this was in fact a JPL early career hire uh, experiment. It wasn't all the mission assurance and, you know, you have to be working on this for 20 years before we, you can do it. These were people pretty much right out of school. It was a very interesting uh, sealed canister with primarily COTS uh, um, hardware. You could only do that on ISS because it was pretty big and, and bulky. Uh, but once we got it up there, it turned about to be, out to be a pretty valuable e experiment to have uh, doing 50 megabits per second down just to uh, uh, beacon up. In fact, one of the things we did was actually use the range measurement capabilities with us to actually look at sort of some of the flexure and the location of, of ISS, which was kind of an entertaining um, experiment. So that's sort of where we've been. Uh, let me take a look at where, where we're going. In the near term, uh, we're actually looking at, uh, in, in 2019, launching, launching the LaserCom relay demo, uh, which is going to provide 1.244 gigabits per second uh, from, from the ground. Uh, it's actually a, uh, this uh, picture doesn't quite, quite show it, but it actually is up and down optical, so the uh, optical uplinks, optical downlinks at 1.244 uh, with a switching relay on, on the spacecraft. Uh, we, of course, do have the RF because there is that cloud stuff we have to figure out how to deal with, and we haven't built enough ground stations yet. Um, coming not, soon, not long after that, uh, terminal on ISS that we'll be talking to, um, to the LaserCom relay uh, demo platform. And then finally, using actually the same terminal that uh, a version of the terminal that's going to be flying on the ISS, Whenever we launch EM2, and I think the latest date on that is 23, but I, don't quote me on that because I can't, uh, can't remember exactly, but we will go back to the moon and, and again do an experiment from uh, EM2 uh, to support video from, uh, ho hopefully to support video from, from uh, the capsule. Those, this, this one's pretty solid. That's definitely launching in 19. These other two sort of depend upon a lot of the, uh, what goes on in those programs and the availability of mass, power, dollars, all those things that, that go along with that. Uh, this one's pretty likely. This one's still in, in discussion. Um, then we're looking at, okay, so, the, so you've heard a lot about uh, relays so far today. This is the, the NASA version of it. We're moving into uh, higher, higher data rates. We're looking at sort of, and this is, this is, you see this date, this is 2024, so we're talking pretty far out there at this point. We're still in sort of the, the development stage of this. Hundreds of gigabits per second uh, up and down and between satellites, 10 gigabits per second to the users. We're really pushing optical comm, you know, gigabit per second, two gigabits per second, sort of been there, done that. So the next thing is, is really um, how can we get up to the higher data rates that uh, really uh, differentiates optical comm from, say, say RF. And so that's, that's where we're going with our relay kinds of approaches. Uh, in one, one of the things that's actually sort of a setup for this is, is actually testing some of these things in, in low Earth orbit. So in fact, probably before we do the relays, we're going to put some of these, and these are fiber telecom based systems, okay? We're not developing a whole lot of new hardware for this. These are these little bricks that do these really high data rate, uh, 1550 uh, optical comm things on, on fiber. We're trying to fly as many of those, you know, trying not to have to change everything and fly it if we can. Uh, radiation obviously is an issue when you're in space, uh, but that's, we're gonna test, test out some of these things in, in low earth orbit. Um, Again, we will probably have RF, uh, T, T, and C, but those, that's, uh, again, probably near term, um, 100 to 200 gigabits per second. We'd like to get it into a very small volume just to show that it can be done. Um, finally, which is, of course, dear to my heart since I'm from JPL and we do a lot of the deep space stuff, is uh, deep space optical comm, which we've been, you know, we started, you showed, I showed it back in 1992, shooting lasers at Galileo. But we've now finally, uh, we, we believe, gotten a ride on the discovery mission, NASA discovery mission to the asteroid Psyche. 
Uh, and so we're flying the, the so-called Deep Space Optical Comm demonstration on that launch, ideally in 2021. And uh, maximum data rate that this thing uh, can, can handle be 250 megabits per second, um, although we're, we're only going into a five meter telescope here. And if they ask me the right questions later on about what I want for Christmas, I'll answer that question uh, quite easily. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, this is the Hale Telescope in Mount Palomar. I think the level one requirement is 125 megabits per second, but we do hope as we, get, as we start going out uh, to do 250 megabits per second. Uh, longer term, deep space, of course, we're, we're looking for uh, beyond Psyche, looking at the planets. Um, much larger telescopes. Uh, we're looking at a, a number of different options, you know, big, big new optical telescope, or in fact, we're looking at some hybrid RF optical telescopes. Take out the center part of, of, of your uh, RF telescope and put, a, put glass in there and make it an optical telescope. So a lot of things that we're doing moving forward. Uh, NASA is very committed to uh, infusion of optical comm into our operational support for science. Uh, and exploration missions, and I just wanted to uh, give credit to Dr. Don Cornwell, who at NASA headquarters is the lead for the optical comm uh, area and, and the driving force behind a lot of what, what's going forward, and thank him for that. And so that's it. Thank you very much. If you haven't ever recognized what the difference between exploration and application is, you saw it today. It just went to nearly un unnoticed, like stating like 2024 is still far out there. If you talk with an exploration guy, I would say that's the next mission we have to plan right now, right? In full panic mode. And for a satellite application guy, this is like several generations ahead. Now we complete the roundup with Matthias Mozikemba. He was born in Frankfurt, Maine in 1962. He's a graduate engineer in telecommunication and focused his study to optical communication networks. He started his career in 1988 as head of projects at ANT Nachrichtentechnik Bosch Telekom GmbH in Germany for the global defense market with key account for the German Air Force. Later on, he hold, held the leading job positions at the telecom industry in Germany. And he's also, this is kind of interesting, a member of the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany, which I find kind of unique. He's working at TESAT Spacecom GmbH and KG in Backnang, Germany. Hope I pronounced it properly since 2011. And he's responsible for communication systems in the role of a director in TESAT. Matthias, we're looking forward to your presentation. Super, thank you, Norbert, so for the introduction. Um, yeah, and thanks also to, to Steve and all, all the, uh, the members of the panel yeah, to, to give me now the floor because uh, I'm a non-government uh, uh, company, TSAT. Um, so we are following the, the, the plans and uh, we would like to see, of course, what is, what is inside such technology, what, is a, what can we offer, what is the benefit for the society of such technology. And then normally uh, a company like, like TSAT is starting to make their, their own business plans on that to say, okay, um, if there is a market outside, we have to start to do that. Uh, we see that uh, this is, that technology is exactly um, the, the new layer. What you find in, uh, in, in, in the, on, the, on, on Earth is that you have a terrestrial network based on fiber, on fiber networking. Uh, you are, might be quite happy if your, your, your flat, your household get a 60 megabit uh, connectivity for, uh, for uh, DSL digital subscriber for internet service. Uh, we are offering here 1.8 gigabit between these geo-satellites, uh, so a factor of, of 30 then, uh, even more, but under, under more harder conditions, which is uh, 80,000 kilometers, or between these geos, you have to, uh, in, in a worst case, you have one, two, three, and then you have to go for, for 80,000 kilometer to, uh, um, to, to establish this link. Um, and uh, uh, the, the beauty of that is, and, and therefore I uh, like the, uh, the, the uh, uh, contract or the, the, the things before, is um, that it is a resilient technology. Uh, most of the problems we have today in, in governmental uh, um, communication networks, um, also uh, explained by, by my colleague here from Australia, is that uh, you have these jamming problems, not even if that it is an unintentional jamming by by reuse of, of uh, too much frequencies, uh, sometimes it's also intentional. So therefore, uh, that is a plan to expand uh, resilient um, uh, communication infrastructure. 
So um, based on, on that vision we had, uh, we started uh, uh, with an ignition point in 1997. Um, and it was exactly what we have or find today that you read a lot uh, in, in, the, in the news or find in the internet that uh, there are upcoming constellations, constellations in the LEO orbit, uh, OneWeb, LEOSAT, TELESAT, uh, they, they are planned to, to go for, for that new market um, to provide also for the benefit of the society a new setup of broadband uh, connectivity. Uh, so a full coverage of the, of the Earth with the benefit that you do not have these uh, latency problems um, and uh, you can deliver uh, a broadband service like internet to, to every spot. Um, we were then, we, or we, were the country, we got the contract uh, as Bosch Telecom. Uh, we we uh, built up our, our industrial setup. Unfortunately, it, it never came to the, to, the, to the right setup, but we continue with that. So with this ignition point, we, we believed in that business plan. We spent our own money. We get a very, uh, very good uh, funding and, uh, and, and belief in this technology inside Germany with a, a DLR, German Space Agency. We signed partner agreements with the uh, US Department of Defense to had then the first in 2007, so 10 years. It took us 10 years uh, to come to the first generation of Lasercom with US Enfire and the, and the German Terrasa X. Um, and then we had here these, these 5.6 gigabit between two very fast moving satellites, 6,000 kilometer. And uh, this was a, 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 the proof of the pointing acquisition and tracking, which is the hardest thing to do in such technology. Six years later, then, we, we had the second generation uh, of 50 kilogram device flying on AlphaSat uh, to master the long range, 45,000 kilometer, uh, 1.8 gigabit. Um, and this is now, that's exactly the, the core technology inside the European data relay system. Uh, it, uh, it feeds now the service for the Sentinel. So uh, we had a, a presentation also here in this room regarding the, the use and the benefit to use these data from Sentinel. And we are very happy that we can deliver with this new fiber, fiber in space, uh, a fast uh, upload of the Sentinel data to the, uh, to the AlphaSat or now to the EDRS uh, satellites. Then we decide to go for the next, next step, of course, that uh, the second generation 50 kilogram is sometimes too, too heavy for smart or for smaller satellites. Therefore, now the third generation here um, also found uh, first uh, customers in a, in a France program, uh, V2020, um, and that's now a form factor of uh, reduction of further of, uh, of a factor of three, uh, smarter version also in, in terms of cost. So we have to recalculate uh, if this might be uh, affordable products. Meanwhile, that's uh, our motivation that we do not have a, a solved uh, technologies or though that we become a market leader and we can deliver uh, more products, more affordable. Um, and today, of course, we have a, the, the, the yeah, a very, very, very uh, small uh, constellation laser com terminal, 10 gigabit, 6,000 kilometer. Um, so you see what I would like to share is that it took time, some time to come. Uh, sometimes you, you find other uh, markets uh, in, on, on your way, on your way to go, but at the end um, it, it, must, uh, it must fulfill the need of the customer. So today we have, and in 2017, we are celebrating uh, in, in Germany these 10 years of Lasercom real hardware in orbit. And that's not, uh, that's not a plan, it's that we are there uh, 10 years. We have now fulfilled uh, more than 5,000 uh, links. Success rate is 100%. Each link which uh, is planned is established. Uh, acquisition times uh, 20 seconds yeah, between the satellites, 1.8 gigabit, 6 uh, or now 10 gigabit uh, delivery of the data. And based on that, um, we have now expanded our, our portfolio uh, and we have it dedicated, made for the, for the market. So uh, I guide you through. Um, you, you already learned that we were focused on the data relay market, so we have uh, 
uh, a geo solution on these birds here, resilient backbone. We have Leo Smarts yeah, flying on the Earth observation satellites, giving the uplink. Uh, we have then uh, airborne market in focus that also these uh, UAVs get a connectivity uh, to the birds that you can fly a mission out of your uh, so beyond line of sight. Um, we are focusing to the constellation market, which is more a commercial market, maybe not uh, given for, the, for this, which are the specialized um, uh, the terminals. And not to forget the direct to earth market, where, where a lot of activities are. Here we are also using 50 50 technology uh, because we think that, that 1064 is, uh, is the best effort for the, the best uh, what you can do for the long range and 50 50 for the short. So we have then here uh, three, this is a TOSIRIS based on the um, uh, EKN uh, partnership, uh, 10 gigabit to, to, uh, down to earth. And the cubes, the smallest one. So I guess that's, a, that's the smallest laser comm terminal you can find. It's not the cube, it's inside that. So it's one layer and they deliver 100 megabit, uh, which is also a factor of 100 what you can find today. Uh, 300 crumbs, so a very nice thing, and you can see all these things outside on the booth uh, of, of uh, uh, Corporation of Germany. So, in total, uh, what I can offer is uh, that uh, first, what you should take with you is that it is a technology with which you can buy. It's not a research uh, thing, it's a commercial availability there. So, TSAT is a, a company uh, which gives a, a clear service level agreement. Yeah, we, we deliver in, in, in short time. No wavelength preference using, we think, best technology counts. So very uh, uh, important to understand, though, because otherwise I will raise some questions why you use set and why you use set. It's not a question. It's uh, use what you, how to solve the problem. Um, and of course, and, and that's my, my uh, uh, conclusion is, it is now uh, like a fiber in space, and we are looking now for more applications um, to, to see it uh, as, a, as a carrier for the internet uh, in the sky and uh, to, to be for the quantum key distribution also uh, uh, to open the next border for enabling uh, more technology moves. Thanks. So we have seen that in the meantime, you have been very, very yeah, creative and just come up with a few questions. Thanks very much for your presentation. Stephanie, I think you have the first question from the audience. Well, I was going to ask one about what are some of the challenges that come with optical comm technology that you believe would uh, fit into your area? Dr. Could you Could you repeat the question, please? The challenge is that the, the technology is uh, at the moment working, it's operating very well. But the terminals operating at the moment is a one size fits all terminal. So there are still developments going on, adapting them to different applications. Some of them were just presented by uh, Matthias Motsigemba. So the terminals for Leo Leo connections, for crowns to uh, space connections, and all the different uh, developments. So uh, in in the future we won't we will see different terminals for different applications, and then it will be a commodity to have optical communication on board of satellites. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Sometimes I've heard that uh, lasers, when you think about you know, all these laser pointers everywhere, it, it is an eye safety issue. So how much of a problem is that, Dr. Simpson? Well, one of the things that I was going to say is I definitely think that all communications is converging with cyber challenges and electronic warfare challenges. And what we're going to see is that really take a new life as the data rates go up and up and up with optical communications. And it really will become a challenge to deal with the issues of cyber, which are, of course, increasing every day. So that's, I see, one of the big challenges. Thank you so much. Okay. You see, in the meantime, that we have a bit of a slideshow in the background. That's also to trigger your creativity. And the two pictures that you have seen before with the 
photos, um, with the astrophotos, were taken with this little telescope over there. And I use this occasion now to ask, especially uh, my NASA friend and here, the gentleman from DLR, but all the others as well, if we think about the recent missions we just had to the comet, of course, and then, of course, Cassini, which just more or less had to dump in Saturn, how would these missions have changed if we had laser communications? Hopefully this is on. Yeah, OK. Um, I, I think, it, obviously, what we're trying to do with LaserCom for our, our uh, deep space missions and our science missions is just get, get more data back. I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude, more data that you could get back uh, from any, any given place. And, and of course, we spend a lot of money to get the spacecraft there. And the most important thing is all the science data that we get and getting, getting it back. And so the more we can get back, example, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, really nice spacecraft with actually pretty good telecom system, three meter antenna, but we cannot actually map all of the surface and get all of the data back uh, in any reasonable time just because we're limited with RF. We would believe with, the, with optical, um, we, could, we could do much better and bring that much more data, particularly when you start talking hyperspectral imagers or radars, that kind of things. That far away, LaserCom should allow us to get more data back. So I think that the, the optical communication is uh, the uh, optical space communication is mandatory because of the, the frequency allocation of the RF region. And you, you show, uh, yes, that's right. You show the, the, the this chart shows uh, our RF resources. The frequency resource is very tight. So optic, uh, if we send our over the gigabit data by, by RF, it's, 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 it's difficult. It's difficult. It's, 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 it will be able to using our RF technology uh, technically, but it is difficult to to allocate to give to get the allocate to the, the um, wavelength allocate. So, and I think that the optical communication is necessary for the next wide and the communication. Just a brief intervention from my side. I would like to support what uh, Steve just said. Uh, the, the EDRS system is just to get more data back, to harvest uh, the Copernicus system, which has been established with a lot of money from the European taxpayers, uh, and to harvest their data to the, the, the optimum way. And uh, so we're very glad EDRS become an integral part of this whole system, and it produces a lot more data. So the Sentinel system at the moment is uh, the system which produces the, the most of Earth observation remote sensing data in the world. The, the, the data is, fr is free and open for everyone. So I think there's a real benefit for society, and EDRS contributes to that considerably. We're very happy, we're very happy that we have uh, that also as, a, as, an, as, a, as an anchor customer for, for that system, and uh, we expect industry to develop this uh, possibility also even further. <clears throat> the use of, of lasercom would, would change the total uh, the, the payload design. You do not need to, st you, uh, to store your data. You do not need these, these high mass memory if you have a high data rate solution. And then you, of course, yeah, can, uh, can have these uh, user space or uh, for, for, for others for, for, your, for your real uh, sensors yeah, uh, to, to build it more smaller. You see that um, all these, uh, it's a good example is this telescope. The telescope is the antenna. And um, if you compare it to the RF, where you have to carry a, a huge antenna uh, and all the size, weight, and power you need to, uh, to transfer or to operate a, um, an RF, uh, all these can be saved for, for the real sensors. Um, while we're talking about telescopes, just a quick one. Just give me a feeling. How big are these telescopes that you currently use in space for these optical links? What kind of size do they have? We make now a, a short round, OK? <laughs> So 13.5 centimeter, that's on the Geo, and seven centimeter, so like this size, and seven centimeter on the Leo. And this is three centimeter. I think for the deep space optical comm, we're using uh, 22 centimeters on the spacecraft. Uh, for the, the more near Earth things, and, uh, and I think it was true of, uh, of the LADI experiment also, 10 centimeter class telescopes for um, most of the user terminals uh, probably moving to 20 to 30 centimeters for some of the relay telescopes. And uh, as far down as you, we saw one of the CubeSats five centimeter class. So kind of all over the map. On the other hand, on the ground side, meter to 10 meter class telescopes.
And since you may not be able to really judge how big it is, this is a nine centimeter telescope. So 90 millimeter C90. Okay, Stephanie. So with all these uh, smaller, smaller um, hardware, should more and more constellations have optical communications? Should we move towards optical communications? Any, anyone? Well, well I, I would think, as I just pointed out very briefly in my presentation, that there is a real potential for optical communication in constellations. As I said, I, I still have difficulties understanding the business case of these constellations, even more so if they don't have intrasatellite links, because 70% of their huge investment is just over sea and not connected to ground and not connected anywhere, just that investment. Only with intrasatellite links, I mean, you could use the whole system. I think there is a huge potential there. Great, Dr. Kraft. Dr. Simpson? Well, I would think that all constellations will have optical comms in the future. It's just a question of how much is going to be optical and how much is going to be RF. I don't believe that optical comms from space to ground are going to completely replace RF anytime soon because of the problems with weather. It may be that we can do all sorts of fancy things to gradually increase the amount of optical and decrease the amount of RF, but we're still going to be left with some RF for a long time into the future. Thank you so much. Which brings us to a very intelligent question, I suppose, uh, we have here as well, uh, regarding Woomera and other sites. Which are the best sites to do optical communication? Can you do it in the Netherlands, where it's always raining? <laughs> Yes, you can do. <laughs> it's a, it depends on the availability. Yeah, uh, of course, it's a, there are a lot of uh, of, of studies and paper uh, published uh, where you see uh, so 30 years of, of cloud uh, um, uh, coverage availability. So there are there's a very nice uh, uh, presentation also in, available from for everyone. Uh, from DLR here, uh, Mr. Selmayer, I see it, uh, here someone in, this, in the third row. Uh, you can download and you see then the, the cloud, cloud coverage, cloud uh, um, uh, map, and uh, there are beautiful sites, especially here in Australia. So congratulations, <laughs> um, uh, but also South Africa and uh, so every, everywhere where you have a good, good cloud uh, um, uh, situation. Yeah, but then we have now our our ground station is located in in Tenerife Island, uh, with 1.8 gigabit. Uh, we are planning six campaigns per per, per year. Yeah, so and uh, meanwhile we have uh, 100 130 links successfully done. So um, of course, yeah, it is a, a question of clouds. Okay, so Phil, I ask you then, if I give you one million Australian dollars and I tell you you gotta buy some patches of land to install your telescopes, now really don't give me exactly the locations in latitude and longitude, but where would you install them? Give me the top five locations in the world. Well, I guess as I showed in my presentation, I think we can definitely do what we would call anchor station links to ground in central Australia, as long as we have a number to distribute them. I think that's probably some of the best locations in the world, unless you can do high mountains, which we can't do because we don't have any. But I guess when I talk laser comm from space to ground, I'm thinking of the anchor stations for linking into the terrestrial fibre infrastructure, yes, but in the military sense, we're also thinking about links directly from satellites to military platforms. Think ships, think soldiers, think vehicles, think aircraft. And of course, that's much more challenging because you can't tell them only to go in areas where the sun is shining. So that's why I think we need RF for the indefinite future. Okay, so Australia and the others, you've evaded. What are the others, what are the other locations? Well, anywhere where there's high mountains. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Uh, obviously, all the places where you have big optical telescopes these days, visible okay. optical telescopes, those are good places for optical comm. Um, no clouds or reasonable clouds. I think Matthias talking about the cloud-free line of sight sorts of things. Um, and reasonably benign turbulence, higher up, the better off you are with, with that. So, you know, South Africa, the Andes, uh, it, desert, Pretty much, you know, anywhere high high desert is pretty good places. But I would emphasize, I, I don't think you want to 
keep it to that because when you're trying to come down from space, you want as many places as possible to come down. And so you may have some places that aren't ideal, but the one time when your ideal location is cloudy, the less ideal place may actually not be cloudy. And so it's, it's a joint probability sort of problem is looking, looking at uh, where, where will it be cloudy so that if I'm looking at geo, I may be looking around multiple different locations to bring, bring it down, which raises some interesting questions about 100 gigabits per second in flight and what happens to all that data once the clouds show up. So. But that's a networking problem, not an optical problem. <laughs> okay, thanks. So a lot of this has a lot of um, really exotic places, I would say. And it also includes a lot of different countries that may not be as advanced or more of an emerging space agency. So would this mean a lot more international cooperation in the future in the world of optical comm? Would NASA please respond? So ab ab absolutely. And, and uh, again, we're, we're working in the, in the uh, CCSDS realm these days, uh, Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, to try to develop standards for optical comm both from deep space, from LEO to ground, high data rate kind of relay applications. And so the more we can do that, the better off we'll be. Uh, from my personal perspective, uh, when I'm looking at things from deep space like these 10 meter class telescopes, NASA's not gonna build a whole lot of 10 meter class telescopes. So we're hoping JAXA and uh, South Africa and Australia, and the new space agency in Australia will you know, pony up some money for one. But uh, you know, that's, that's why, and we, we need interoperability in order to do that so that all, the, all these ground systems will speak the same language as it were. Great, thanks so much. Just one comment there, that was pretty humorous. When we think about exotic locations and Central Australia in the same breath, if anyone thinks Central Australia is exotic, I invite you to go there and see it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid we have to sum up now because we're coming very much to the, very quickly to the end now. And I'd like to sum up a bit what we've had before I fire my last question to the panel, but they have prepared it, hopefully. So we heard from Gerd, for example, at the beginning that already this stuff stems very much back to Graham Bell. And then he gave us a bit of an excursion into EDRS, uh, lots of technology demonstrations in between. We heard that EDRS is up and running. And there is, of 2023, we will have GlobeNet to start its operation. With Philip, we saw there's like two gigabits per satellite around the globe. This is all perfect, all nice, but unfortunately, as soon as a crisis happens, this is like a traffic jam. So it's a complete communication jam. It doesn't really work anymore. And that the really the solution for that one is to use optical links. Shiro-san, he tell, told us about the optical data relay satellite systems and told us that this provides for an increase in observation data volume. It's very handy, especially in the disasters that we heard, right? And just to give a feeling, he said, like, we have 240 megabits per second in KA band. And then if we get into an optical link, we can have 1.8 gigabit per second. Steve gave a nice presentation about LLCD, the Lunar Laser Communication Demonstration, telling us about the 622 megabits per second. I think that's megabits that we can dream of when we use mobile phones most of the time. And as I said, I like pretty much the statement saying 2024 is still far away out there. Uh, that really tells you about applications that are fast, the clock ticks in satellite applications. And Matthias at the end, um, told us that optical satellite satellite links provide for very good resilience, so it's very difficult to jam them. Um, showed us that there's different markets from data relays, airborne, constellations, direct to Earth, right? And more or less comparing it, and this is, I think, was the common sense of it all, that you really have to think that a space optical link is like a glass fiber in space. Now, gentlemen, if you could wish for Christmas, you could write to Father Christmas, to Chris Kind, whatever it is, Père Noël in the world, what would be your wish this year that you write on your letter for space optical communications? Oh, I'm limited to space? Yeah, oh, okay. because else it may be too long and uh, that <laughs> cannot be fulfilled. Okay. No, uh, exactly. It is that um, I would wish that uh, it is not any longer uh, a science discussion going around Lasercom. So for me, it's a, it's, it is a reality. It's like the fiber. Ne ne nobody in the world on telecommunication would buy or would, would reinvent a fiber. They, they are just starting the application on it yeah, and use what, what, is, what is existing. And that is what, what my message, my, my wish would be. So make more out of this technology, use that technology, concentrate on applications. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think for, for me, since you'll, you'll get a lot of perspective on sort of the near Earth stuff, I'll go with the deep space thing. I think for me, the ideal would be a really low cost, um, let's call it James Webb class telescope that we could use to get above the clouds to relay data from, uh, uh, from 
Saturn or, or beyond interstellar uh, kind, kinds of missions, but we're a long way from that because you know the price tags on, on, on the large optical telescopes and so, but if I could have my wish, it would be a low cost, uh, large 10 meter aperture uh, spacecraft ab above, above the atmosphere. That looks like a hefty wish like for Santa Claus to me. <laughs> Okay, shiro -san. So one message I want to say, I want to send is uh, the, the now is uh, the generation of optics. We use the, the spread the optics for the human for the happiness of the humankind. Thank you. Okay, well that's a pretty easy one from me. In the military, it's very very simple. What we want is quantum key distribution and quantum computer ca communications for obvious reasons. We don't need quantum computers. We don't need quantum teleportation, but just key distribution and communications. Magnificent. <laughs> um, uh, as I mentioned before, I would like to uh, see. Uh, oh, optical communication become a commodity so that it's something which uh, somebody could use just uh, as uh, somebody could use different frequencies of uh, RF transponders. You just look at a catalog and what suits you best for your application, then you just also choose your uh, laser communication terminal. That's uh, what I would uh, envision for the future. I, I agree with Phil that uh, laser communication will not substitute RF. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. But it should be a, a, a part of it, and it should be also an viable option, and we're very close to that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And also, we heard now that uh, space communications on space applications really, really fast. I wonder, what is the voice of to you, Stephanie? What do you think about that one? What's your wish? My wish is to, I guess, encourage more students and young professionals to go into the optical comm world, and hopefully there is a marketplace for them in the future. Wow. Okay, then I think at that point we thank the speakers. And we thank the audience for coming early, for giving really good questions and for paying full attention. Thanks very much, gentlemen and ladies.